Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today I'm having a look at a fascinating piece of early 20th century office equipment. This is a Gestetner cyclostyle or cyclograph, also known as a stencil duplicator or a mimeograph. And these were among the first machines that could produce large volumes of document copies in an office setting and predated the modern photocopier by nearly a century. Now, up until the 1880s, there weren't a lot of options available for copying documents. Very large runs in the thousands could be handled by a print shop, but this required the production of a dedicated form of movable type or an offset printing plate, and this could get quite expensive. For the much smaller volumes typically encountered in an office, documents had to be painstakingly copied and proofed by hand, which is why offices traditionally employed large numbers of clerks or scriveners. Now, the introduction of typewriters and carbon paper improved the situation somewhat, but these methods were still very limited. Enter one David Gestetner. Now, Gestetner was born in 1854 in Chorna in Hungary, and in the late 1870s worked in the stock exchanges of Vienna and New York. It is here they became rather frustrated with having to write out his daily results multiple times by hand and began looking for a way to automate this process. Now, accounts vary as to how he finally came up with the idea that would make him very wealthy. And one of the more fanciful accounts states that while working briefly as a Japanese kite salesman in Chicago, as you do, Gestetner accidentally spilled a bottle of ink on a stack of kites and noticed that the same pattern was replicated as the ink soaked through the various layers of paper. A uh, more plausible account has Gestetner briefly working for a company in Vienna that produced hectographs, which is an early copying system using gelatin that we will look at in a future video. And it is from this process that he developed his ideas. Now, whatever the case, Gestetner came up with something called the cyclostyle, which, although that word was eventually applied to machines like this one, was originally a type of stylus or pen with a little toothed wheel at the end, almost like a pounce wheel. This is used together with a stencil made out of wax-coated paper. And when you drew on the stencil with the cyclostyle, it would cut a broken line in the wax. You would then place a sheet of paper on a special flatbed, place the stencil over top of it, and then spread it with ink using an ink roller or a brayer. And that ink would be forced through those tiny holes cut by the cyclostyle onto the paper replicating the text. And this could be done a couple of hundred times until the stencil wore out and had to be replaced. Now, in 1879, Gestetner moved to London, where he briefly joined the Fairholme Stationery Company and patented a lot of his ideas. And then in 1881, he founded the Gestetner Cyclograph Company in order to produce his inventions. Now, at around the same time, a number of other inventors had come up with very similar systems for copying documents. One of the earliest was the papyrograph system invented by Eugenio Zucchetto in 1874. And this was very similar to Gestetner's system, only the stencils were produced by writing on a piece of shellac paper using a special corrosive ink. But the most direct competition to Gestetner was a device invented in 1876 by Thomas Edison, the autographic electric pen. So this was a pen-like device with a little battery-powered motor in it that drove a rapidly reciprocating needle. And you would use this in conjunction with a grooved base plate to write out text in a series of little holes on a piece of thick blotting paper. And this produced a stencil, which could then be placed on top of a sheet of paper and rolled with ink, just like in Gestetner's system, to reproduce the text. Now, as an interesting aside, in 1891, one Samuel O'Reilly would adapt Edison's design to produce the first electric tattoo pen, the design of which has remained relatively unchanged to the present day. Now, in 1887, one Albert B. Dick of Chicago licensed Edison's patent and gave it the trade name of Mimeograph, which would soon become a genericized trademark like Kleenex or Xerox, being applied to all stencil duplicators regardless of manufacture. And in 1891, Gestetner would come up with an improved model known as the automatic cyclostyle, and this retained the flatbed of earlier designs, but had an automatic ink spreading system. So this consisted of three rollers mounted on a sliding track, and you would apply a tube of thick ink to the middle roller. And then as you crank the handle, it would spread this ink thinly over the two rollers and then spread it over top of the stencil. These machines were an overnight success. And in 1906, Gestetner opened a factory in Tottenham Hale, North London, 
to keep up with demand. And from here, the company would only continue to grow. Indeed, at the height of its powers, the Gestetner company employed some 6,000 people in its factories, had subsidiaries in 52 countries, and sold and serviced machines in 153. And the competition between Gestetner and the Dick Company in Chicago would grow so fierce that eventually an agreement was reached whereby the Dick Company would control the North American market, whereas Gestetner would retain the British and international markets. Now, in 1898, the Neostyle Company introduced the world's first rotary cyclostyle, in which the stencil was wrapped around a rotating drum through which the paper could be fed. And this significantly improved the printing speed since now the operator no longer had to insert and remove the paper and the stencil one at a time. And this would become the standard design for these machines going forward. And that first model was marketed as the Rotary Neo style or Roneo, Roneo, and that itself would become another genericized trademark being applied to all sorts of stencil duplicators regardless of manufacturer. Right, so let's finally have a closer look at this particular machine to see how it works. So this is a Gestetner number no. 3 machine manufactured at the Gestetner Cyclostyle Works in Tottenham Hale and sold through the company's Canadian subsidiary in Toronto. Now, I wasn't able to find an exact date of manufacture for this particular machine, but given that the Tottenham Hale Works were built in 1906, and the Gestetner number no. 6, which was one of their more popular models, started production in the 1920s, I'm going to guess that this one was made sometime in the 1910s. Now, to use this machine, you first had to create a stencil. Now, the stencils were originally made out of wax-coated mulberry paper, the same paper used to make kites, but later this was changed to long grain paper coated in celluloid plastic. The traditional way of making a stencil by hand was using the cyclostyle pen. You could buy all sorts of letter stencils and graphics templates to help you create whatever images you wanted, and even textured underlays to do shading effects. Uh, companies also sold something called a cycloscope, which is basically just a light table to help you with tracing, since the stencil material was quite a bit more opaque than regular paper. You could also produce a stencil using a typewriter, although you had to set the typewriter to the stencil setting. And you'll find this on pretty much every modern typewriter. And what it does is it disables the mechanism that causes the ribbon to rise up between the type and the paper, and thus allows the type to strike the stencil directly and cut through the wax. And if you happen to make a mistake, you can actually fix that using a special correction fluid, of which I have an example here. This particular brand is called Improva, and so this is basically liquid rubber cement or sometimes a collodion, liquid celluloid, that you would paint over the mistake and this would seal off the hole that you'd punched and prevent the ink from seeping through onto the paper. And there were a whole bunch of different brands of this available, including my two favorites, Obliterine and Snowpake. So once your stencil was ready, you would wrap it around this silk screen that runs around these two rollers and fix it in place using this hinged retainer bar. You would then turn the handle until the inside surface of the stencil was fully coated with ink. Then you'd be ready to feed in your paper which would go in this side and come out the rear here into a convenient folding tray. So if we remove this screen, we'll see that there is a third, more porous rubber roller inside, which would be spread with a very thick oil-based ink. And what happens is, when you turn the crank, this roller is going to spread a thin layer of ink over the rollers and the inside of the silk screen. And you'll see that this has a reciprocating mechanism to wipe that roller back and forth, to spread a more even layer of ink. Now, when the stencil reaches the bottom position, it is going to come up against this waver roller at the bottom. You'll see that that roller is eccentrically mounted so that as the silk screen rolls over it, it is going to apply a rolling wave of pressure from one side of the roller to the other. And this solves the problem of having a flat roller where that roller might have high and low spots and not apply even pressure. And so what this is going to do is it's going to squeeze the ink from the roller through the screen and then through the stencil onto the paper, thus reproducing the text. And you can continuously feed paper as long as you want while turning the crank. Now, different mimeograph brands and models had different inking systems. For example, in the Gestetner Model 260 from the 1950s, the ink was supplied from a replaceable squeeze tube, almost like a toothpaste tube, that had to be attached inside the mechanism before operation. Single drum models typically had an ink reservoir in the drum itself, which would be topped up through a filler plug, 
Uh, cheaper models had an external cotton inking pad, while the cheapest models actually had to have the drum painted with ink by the operator while they were turning the machine. Now, generally speaking, Gestetner machines were considered superior to their American counterparts, largely because the silkscreen process produced higher quality results. Also, Gestetner machines tended to have superior registration controls, that is, controls that allowed you to adjust where the text or image was printed on the page. However, one task at which the American single drum machines were arguably superior was color printing, since you could actually swap out the drums easily for each individual color. Now, color printing could be done on a twin drum machine like this one, but it was a bit more of an involved process. So first, what you had to do was cover the silk screen in an ink pad, which is basically a thick sheet of blotting paper. You then attached your stencil at one end and then painted on the back side all the colors that you wanted in the areas you wanted them. You then press this down onto the ink pad and lifted it up. And wherever the ink had been deposited, you would then paint more ink. You then clamped the stencil in place and then ran your papers through the machine. Now, as you can imagine, you would only be able to run a couple of documents through at a time until you had to top up the ink. But while this was a laborious process, the greater registration control on Gestetner machines meant that they often produced superior results when using multiple colors. Right, so let's have a look at some of the other controls on this machine. On the back here, we have an adjustment knob and an indicator dial, and this is the only registration control on this particular machine. And this adjusts how high or low the image is printed on paper. We also have a counter here on the side for keeping track of how many copies you've produced. And finally, we have this lever on the side, which enables and disables the waiver rollers. So if you're setting up the machine and you just want to spread ink on the inside of the silk screen and the stencil, you would disable the rollers and then you would enable them right before feeding paper into the machine. And that is really all there is to the Gestetner number no. three, a remarkably simple and robust device, though not without its limitations. Typically, a stencil was good for a few hundred copies, after which it started to wear out. The wax would wear out or start to crack, allowing ink to seep through in different places, creating ugly blotches that obscured the text, and it would also start to stretch with use, distorting the text. Though this was typically good enough for the small volumes of copies encountered in the average office. And if there was a special case in which you needed a much larger volume of copies, you could have a special, more robust stencil produced out of thin etched metal. Now, over the decades, Gestetner and other manufacturers introduced a number of technical improvements to the basic mimeograph design, including more sophisticated registration controls and, most notably, electrification, which greatly increased the rate at which copies could be produced. But by the 1920s, these were becoming very complex and unwieldy and, frankly, ugly machines. And so in 1929, Gestetner hired an up-and-coming industrial designer to improve the styling of their Model 66 machine. And what he did was to encase the machine in a streamlined metal case and mount it on a cabinet base for storing ink, paper, and other supplies. And this became the form factor for these machines going forward. And that designer's name was Raymond Louis, and he would go on to great fame for producing such design classics as the modern Coke bottle, the Lucky Strike cigarette package, and the livery from Air Force One. Now, David Gestetner died in 1939 at the age of 85, and in addition to his numerous innovations in the field of document copying, he was also the inventor of modern nail clippers. Who knew? Now, upon his death, the company was taken over by his son, Zygmunt, and continued to dominate the office copying industry for another 50 years, and they managed to stay ahead of the curve and adapt to changing technology. And indeed, in 1973, they started producing their own line of xerography machines, i.e. modern photocopiers. Now, in 1995, the company was bought up by the Japanese multinational Ryko and is now operated as the NRG Group. And interestingly enough, Mimeograph machines are still produced and widely used in the form of the risograph, in which a digitally controlled thermal head is used to etch small holes in a plastic stencil, which is then wrapped around a drum and used with ink, just as in a traditional mimeograph. And compared to xerography, the risograph is actually more reliable and a lot cheaper for larger runs of documents, over 100. 
So this is a very old and venerable technology, but one that is still useful to this day. Now, on the social side of things, the impact of mimeography cannot be overstated. Not only did this greatly reduce the amount of labor needed to produce copies of documents, leading to the near extinction of the office scrivener, but this also provided access to large volume printing to people who were previously denied it. So, for example, fringe political groups could now print and distribute large volumes of literature without having to go to a professional print shop, which might deny them access on political grounds or report them to the authorities. On the less radical side of things, this provided small organizations like churches or schools the ability to produce large volumes of copies. And indeed, mimeography and other small-scale printing devices like this were instrumental in the rise of fanzines and fan culture as a whole. So this really is a machine that changed the world. Now, one last thing to mention before I end the video is that mimeographs are often conflated with a similar but separate technology known as a spirit duplicator, sometimes known as a ditto or banda machine. And those are interesting enough in their own right that I'm going to save that particular technology for another video. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time in another video or look at yet more fascinating printing technology and other devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.